Oh, I have, the, I have this. Hi. Um, once my slides come up. Um, I'm going to be talking about function as a service tooling. So um, it's funny. I, I'm, I'm one of the hosts of the serverless community podcast. And we, one of our first episodes, we talked about tooling. And we talked about it as a chicken and egg problem. Because no one wants to develop for something that doesn't have tooling, but you can't develop tooling without developing for the platform. So we called it a chicken and egg problem. And I can't remember who, I think it might have been Brian Liston said, well, we need both sides of the breakfast plate. <laughs> if you're not a vegetarian or vegan, you can have like scrambled eggs and chicken, that kind of thing. So now that's something we say whenever uh, either a conversation goes bananas or we're talking about a chicken and egg problem is we want both sides of the breakfast plate. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that here today. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I don't know why I put my name there. That's kind of redundant. Uh, I'm also known as the node botanist uh, to some people. That's because I like to run robots with JavaScript, uh, but that's a different, that's a different uh, presentation. Uh, I do DevRel at IOPipe, so things like this, like public speaking. I do a lot of documentation. I generally try to make developers' lives easier when using our product. That's the, the one-liner of what I do. Uh, I, am, I am a serverless and function as a service fan, depending on what name you prefer to call it. At host of the Community Service Podcast, as I mentioned, and I'm also an electrical engineering student at Arizona State Online. So I have a computer science degree, and soon I'll have an electrical engineering degree. Pair with that, that way the robots will kill me last. Anyway, function as a service, aka serverless. Uh, for those of you who are here because you do not know serverless, I'm going to give you the 30 second recap. And that's, no, there are really servers. Serverless is kind of a misnomer. It's just you don't care about the servers in the sense that you don't care uh, what OS they're running, where they're running. Uh, all you really care about is what runtime your code is being run in, and you write code and you deploy it. That's, that's the 30-second overview. I'm sure a lot of other speakers are going to give much more uh, descriptive uh, 101s, and maybe they won't. Either way, um, keep that in mind. There are servers. And you, basically, it's infrastructure as a service i.e. Um, EC2, taken to the next level. You don't just abstract away the hardware that your code is running on. You also abstract away the OS. You also abstract away um, everything that's going on inside that OS. All you have to do is write your code, write your function, and deploy it. And the only thing you really tell your provider in most cases, some, ca some providers allow a little more customization than others, is how much memory you want to be allowed to consume at once, how much CPU you want to be allowed to consume at once, and what runtime of the language that you're using that you want to use. If it's Node, you can say 6.x, 8.x, 0 0.10, which I, I wouldn't know why you'd be using that, but you could. Um, so it's an abstraction away of all of the infrastructure and all of the operations that usually comes with running online functions. This introduces a lot of benefits to the coding community, but it also introduces, on the other side of the coin, quite a few issues. And so I'm going to kind of lump these together into a couple of categories. One is the abstraction that I mentioned before. There's fewer dev logistics to get started, so you don't have to worry about spinning up a container or spinning up um, a, a, mach a machine or a server and then installing Node and then making sure it's the right version of Node and then installing NVM because it's not right the right version of Node, da, 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 da. No, you write a Node function, you hit deploy, it goes, which is great. Um, you can focus more time on your code than your infrastructure. But with that, you have less transparency. You have less of a view of how the environment your code is running in is affecting your code. And that can be a factor. And it makes debugging and monitoring a lot harder because of that lack of transparency in a lot of cases. Uh, it's getting better, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But that's the flip side of the abstraction benefit, is you, can, you can't see quite as easily into how your function is running on in the container. If it's a container, you, sometimes you don't even know if it's a container on that server in, that, in the data center of your provider. Scalability, that's still a fun buzzword in tech. Um, function as a service provides extremely fast scaling because it, it kind of ties into abstraction. Because you don't have to worry about the infrastructure behind your code, your provider, you're paying your provider to worry about that infrastructure, it's usually really easy to just spin up more functions, to just spin up more instances of a function. Uh, you might get a few more cold starts, uh, as in containers and, and servers that need to boot up to run your code, but that's really the, one of the biggest issues for scalability. And then you don't have to do the heavy lifting to scale your functions. You don't have to think about how many servers you need to spin up. You just, need to, you just say, hey, um, 
uh, you, the only thing you really need to worry about for some providers is cost, and for other providers is if you set a hard limit for the number of instances you have, you might need to change that limit from time to time. But other than that, it's not terribly difficult. But there are lots of other pitfalls to scaling other than the ease of spinning up new instances. Um, scaling is tough. It's one of the harder problems we have to deal with as engineers, as, as developers. And the other side of that is, what about the resources that you have that aren't function as a service? What about your databases? What about your thir the third party API that you're using to get data from? Uh, do they scale too? Are they going to kind of become the slow point of your application? Those are things you have to worry about. Modularity. Um, function as a service allows you to create as granular of an application as you wish. This can be great. This can be not so great. Um, you can create apps with small, easy to understand functions, which is really nice for readability and really nice for scalability and refactoring. So for instance, if, if you, uh, I'm going to say the M word, which for some reason is it's, it's serverless and function as a service conferences, is, it's a weird subject, microservices, work really well with, fu with function as a service because you write small functions, you deploy them, and they do their thing. If you need to refactor it, you take one down, you ref well, you don't take it down, you leave the old one running, you refactor it, and then you put in into in the new one into production slowly instead of having to take down your whole application or refactor it all at once. Um, and again, you can scale each function separately. So if you find one is slow, but you know, it 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 it'll run faster if you just have more instances of it, that's at least is a stopgap. It, and it can save you some time, especially if you've got a peak uh, interval of traffic. Downside to modularity is this can create a lot of function calls very, very quickly. And for some providers, that means a lot more expensive a lot very quickly. Um, and how exactly are you going to keep track of everything you've deployed, especially if you're working with a distributed team? It's kind of hard to visualize what's going on with function as a service, especially with um, if you have, for instance, on AWS, if you have functions running on different regions, if you have functions running on different uh, user accounts, it's really hard to see exactly how your app comes together as a group without some sort of visualization. And issues like this are, are why tooling is crucial to the growth of function as a service. If we don't keep bringing our tools up to meet the demands, we're going to have a lot of large companies who move to function as a service and are then bemoaning it two years later, which granted is a very common pattern in tech. We've all seen the graph of everybody's super excited and everybody hates it again, and then you know it kind of evens out, right? I'd like to make that, that downswing as, as, like as, as smooth as possible, more like a fun roller coaster than a, than a drop off a cliff, if you know what I mean. So tooling is really how we're going to get that spike to be more of a slope curve and then we even out because we're going to have a dip in interest. That's just how tech works. So this is a new frontier, and the analogy I like to use is, would you walk into a brand new place that you've never been to without a compass or shelter or food or you know, like a weather report? You know, like when I came here, when I was packing to come here, I was like, all right, what's the weather in Toronto? All right, cool, I know what to wear, right? You wouldn't go somewhere without thinking, okay, I'm gonna plan ahead and make sure I know everything I can about the landscape of where I'm going. And that's true for serverless. You want to know what tools are available to you, and you want to know what's, you, you want to be able to, from the initial development stage, be able to see what exactly is going on and what exactly you're doing and how it impacts the rest of your application. So I'm going to talk about three categories of tools. Development tools, diagnostic tools, and visualization tools. Now, visualization tools, a lot of people would lump these in with diagnostic tools. However, I've split them into their own category because diagnostic tools are for more for when things go wrong, whereas visualization tools are also used when things are going great because you still want to see your app when it's running correctly, right? You don't only want to see your app when something goes wrong because all, another reason is uh, even if things are going great now, visualization is great at spotting problems that may be problems in the future. There we go. Uh, development tools. So these, these tools answer the questions, how do I get started with this? Um, who here has logged on to the AWS dashboard and gone, wait, what am I supposed to be doing here? I'm admitting it, so feel free to admit it too, right? I, so I caught a few, quite a few hands. Up. Same for Azure Functions, same for any tool. Uh, function as a service, one of the downsides of that abstraction is while it's easy to go once you've set up, getting set up can be kind of tricky. 
So development tools kind of make this an easier step. And when I say development tools, I don't just mean things like uh, code step through. I don't just mean things like breakpoints. I don't mean. To, I also mean documentation. I also mean uh, templates. I also mean uh, tutorials. So tools, I, I take a very broad stance on the word tools. Tools are anything you use to make your life easier. So that can be documentation. And, and for development tools, they make developers' lives easier when building, right? So diagnostic tools, where is that smoke coming from? <laughs> Why am I not getting back a response? It works locally, but not in the cloud, which is the new works on my machine. Why? Um, these tools make developers' lives easier when things go wrong. So these are things like step through debugging. These are things like, OK, here's a list of all the network requests that your function made in the last several invocations and how long they took. Um, things like tracing. Visualization tools, what's going on with my app today? You know, like you sit down, you're drinking your coffee, and you're looking, hopefully, at a dashboard that can tell you within about 15 seconds if everything's on fire or everything's not on fire. Uh, is my Lambda down, or is S3 down, or is just all of AWS down? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, in, you know, uh, up until about a year ago, the, if you wanted to know if EC2 was down, you started up Netflix. And if Netflix didn't start up, EC2 was probably down. Um, what's all this going to cost me is an important question answered by visualization tools. You can see how much CPU, how much memory, how many invocations you're going through in a, in a particular app or even a particular function. That pattern is new. Let's tackle that before that pattern becomes a problem. Things like memory spikes, memory leaks. Um, me visualization is great at showing you, hey, when we doubled the number of invocations of this uh, function, the memory usage exponentially went up. All right, we need to fix this before we need to scale that function up even more and we take up way too much memory. Uh, visualization tools, the way I like to put it is, is these tools let developers sleep at night because you're able to see what's going on, you're able to see any icebergs that might be in, the, in your path or off to the side a little bit and you don't want to steer into them, things like that. It's, it's things that let you say, okay, I know my app is working, I can sleep now. So these categories are general categories that can be applied to just about any type of development, right? So I want to go into a little bit about how these categories apply to function as a service. Because there are intricacies and, and things that only really apply to function as a service but fit these categories. Development tools, they help with abstraction because teammate, templates can help decode what the provider is looking for, especially when the provider provides input on those templates. Documentation helps clear things up about uh, questions like, what's the latency on this third-party tool that I'm adding into my function? Um, you know, what's the overhead of it? Uh, scripts help with deployment and authentication. So if you don't want to remember the 50-segment deploy command for AWS, it's an easier way to just say serverless deploy, right? Um, they make your life easier while you're building things. They also help with modularity because frameworks can help, <laughs> thank you, autocorrect, devs build local <laughs> logical structures, create logical boundaries for their functions. Um, you know, it, frameworks can help with that. Uh, I have strong opinions on frameworks, and I, I'll talk about those in a social setting with y'all if you want. But I do believe that in a lot of cases, frameworks provide very good guidelines as to what the provider is looking for in, in what runs on their platform, and that generally tends to run better on their platform. Correlation, I know, but still, it's, it's a correlation that's helped me a lot. So I tend to look at frameworks and documentation from the provider in the sense of, okay, what do they want from my function? What will make my function run best on this platform? Be it AWS, be it Azure Functions, be it OpenWhisk. And a great example of a development tool um, for function as a service is the serverless framework. And I'm going to swap over to their web page here. Uh, it's at serverless.com slash framework. And what it is, uh, why? Where's my pointer? Oh, there it is. OK. So um, it's a CLI tool. It works with most of the major providers of serverless or function as a service. And basically, instead of having to uh, worry about each provider, it abstracts that away. You create a template with the name of your function with your provider, and it sets up the code for you, sets up a, an options file for you that's really well documented. The whole framework is really well documented. Uh, yay, open source. Um, and yeah, so it, it, 
instead of having to deal with the AWS dashboard, I love Amazon and I love AWS Lambda, but the UI of the AWS dashboard, <laughs> I, I, if I can avoid it, I will, because the UI of the AWS dashboard is, is a headache for me. So if there's a tool that can make me not use that as much, but I can still use all of the AWS goodness that I like to use, I will use it. And that's why the serverless framework fits that description so well. It makes devs' lives easier when they're building things. They don't have to worry about, where do I put the access token again? What was the command? What was that, that fourth flag I had to pass to have it deploy to the prod account instead of the staging account? Oh no, I just rewrote master with force. Yeah, that kind of thing. Diagnostic tools. So these help with abstraction because debugging tools are a key component in getting that transparency back. Um, not a lot of uh, function as a service providers have step, step through debugging of their functions. Uh, more are getting it and they're working on it. It's a hard problem to solve. I have to give them credit for that. It is a very hard problem to say, okay, so this function running on a server, I want to be able to step through it on my local machine. Um, Azure Functions, I think, did a excellent job by providing a local runtime because it's much easier to step through something that's running on your computer. But even then, you still want some debugging in the cloud because there are cases, uh, I, I've experienced them, hey, I can bring longboarding into this. So I have a serverless longboard. It has lights on the bottom of it and it has a crash detection system. I'm new to longboarding. I've only been doing it for about four months. So what happens is when uh, the longboard detects a crash, a pendant that I wear lights up. I have 10 seconds to push the button on the pendant or it emails my roommate to tell him to call 911. <laughs> <laughs> it actually emails him and says, Jesse, please look out the window. Cass has probably crashed. Um, and so, yeah, because I only longboard on my street right now because I'm still new. Anyway, um, I was going somewhere with this. I haven't had enough coffee. Ah, uh, yes. So it worked on my local machine. It lit, up, it lit up correctly. Like, I also have the lights flash red when it detects a crash because it looks cool, I guess. Um, it was working on my local machine. It would, it would turn the lights red on the skateboard, and then I put it on the, the cloud, and the lights weren't turning red. And it took two hours for me to figure out what was going on because I, could st I couldn't step through my code. I couldn't step through my code in the cloud and say, hey, okay, what exactly is going on here? All I had were CloudWatch logs, IO pipe, and um, yeah, that's all I had. I didn't have the, that, that third category. And that's why we absolutely need diagnostic tools to be a high priority for any function as a service provider. And it helps with scaling because being able to step through functions can help track down slow calls, race conditions, other symptoms of scale. A lot of symptoms of scale can really only be detected through stepping through code and being able to see all the environment variables that are going on. So we need to be able to do that, especially when we're, as, as we're trying to put more function as a service apps into production, as we're trying to scale them up. This transparency is crucial. A great example of uh, diagnostic tools, um, it's platform dependent, but I still believe it's, it's, it's worth mentioning, is the Azure Core Tools. It, like I said, it allows you to run your Azure functions locally and step through the code, much like you would just a regular node script that you were running on your machine. Um, major kudos to the, the Azure Functions team. Uh, their dev tools are really setting a high bar to, for the other providers to kind of step up their game and, and bring it up. If you want to learn more about this, um, Joe is giving a great talk with a demo of these tools. So I'm kind of providing the high level overview here. If you want to learn more about those tools specifically, Joe's giving a great talk later today. Visualization tools. So like I said earlier, they, a lot of people want to lump visualization tools into diagnostic tools. I view them more as a hand in hand situation than a uh, all-encompassing situation because like I said, you want visualization tools even when your app is working. You want diagnostic tools when something's going wrong. You want visualization tools no matter what because you want to see how your app is performing when it's working so you can see when it's not and you can compare the data between the two. So you can say, oh, this call is taking a lot longer than usual, or that's consuming a lot more memory than it did when things were working. Or you can detect patterns over time. Like I mentioned the example earlier, where if you double the number of invocations of a function, but your memory use is exponentially going up, uh-oh, something's going on. And sometimes it's just nice to see your app running smoothly. I don't know about you, but it just makes me feel better some days when I log, on, log in and I'm like, oh, look, my app's running correctly. Uh-oh, what's going to happen in an hour? 
But you know, you get that slight reprieve from your normal existential dev dread. <laughs> an example, uh, I won't put an adjective in front of that because I work there, so I have bias, is IOPipe. Uh, we just launched our 1.0 and we just announced our, our first round of funding. So um, yeah, I'm kind of proud of what we've, what we've done here. And what we do is we allow visualization and metrics on Lambda functions. And one thing I'm, I'm really excited about that we just launched, oh, yeah, hold on. Oh, all right. Ah, there we go. Oh, come on. Would help if I could type, huh? Okay, it's tracing. And um, so, to cover the rest of it, we start with, you can see your whole app performing. Uh, right now it doesn't look like much because I have most of the functions hidden, but you can see our entire app performing. And then tracing. Oh, it's not. Were any of the websites I was showing showing up on the screen or just this one is not? Oh, that's right, I didn't do mirroring. I'm silly, hold on. Urgh. So I'm going to show you the other websites and then show you um, what I'm talking about. Thank you for letting me know. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see if I remember how to work a computer today. So I mentioned I'm a full-time student. I spent a lot of time last night doing physics, and I may have forgotten how to work computers to some degree, as one does when one is dealing with electrostatics. All right, so let me show you the other websites first. Um, serverless framework. Uh, this will make a lot more sense with the context. So CLI tool you install with NPM, and it allows you to do a lot of the logistics and a lot of the operations without having to, uh, A, worry about provider. Um, the deploy command for an Azure function is the same as an AWS Lambda function. And as someone who is trying all of the platforms constantly, that appeals to me. Um, and it's really well documented, and it's open source. So um, yeah, really, really well documented. As for development tools, the core tools um, from Azure are a really great example of that. They do have step by step through debugging. Um, it, it feels, if you're a Node developer by trade, it feels really natural and it feels really like just like developing a regular Node application that's not running on a function, uh, function as a service cloud. So get kudos to them. And then IOPipe. So this is our um, dashboard. And what we do, let me clear this because it's only showing two functions right now shows all of your functions, right? And then you can also drill down. So I'm going to drill down into a tracing function because I want to show you the, the new fun thing we put out the other day. So then you can look at each function, drill down, and so you've got the number of invocations for this function, uh, the duration, memory consumption, and then we're going to drill down into here, and this is what I'm proud of. Except it's not, maybe it's the other tracing function that I was supposed to click. You practice and practice and practice, and then you just get on stage and all right all right tracing uh is there i just can't seem to find it after practicing last night it shows a graph of uh so the custom metrics actually kind of indicate where the tracing is going so see db start db measure you can set flags in your aws lambda functions and we'll show you a graph of what took how long and it looks like the google um the, the chrome network graph it shows you when it started when it ended and how they overlap and so you can kind of visualize exactly what your function's going through and exactly what's taking what amount of time, which is great when all of a sudden your database is overtaxed and it's taking 2.5 seconds for a database row to come back to your function, and then your function takes four seconds, whereas before you just knew your function was taking four seconds. And you're thinking, why is my function taking four seconds? This is not good. Um, so yeah, tracing. Uh, we also have a blog post that uh, came out on that, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give too much more time to IOPipe so, so as to not, you know, sound like a sales pitch. If you'd like to learn more, talk to me later, but I'm not going to sales pitch anymore there. So there's another distinction here besides the three categories of tools, and that's vendor tools versus third-party tools. And I, I say versus, but there's no, real, there's no real need for an adversarial relationship there, and I'll get into that a little bit. I don't feel an adversarial relationship yet between these two groups. I hope there isn't one in the future, and here's why. We need both. We absolutely need both vendor tools and third-party tools for function as a service to succeed. Well, why do we need vendor tools, you might ask. They allow access to deeper depths of data and insight that then third-party tools will be able to access. The folks who program 
their platform, right? They, their providers, your your Microsoft Azure, your Azure Function devs, your web task, your .io devs, your AWS Lambda devs, they know their platform. And so if they write tools that allow us to see more into what's going on in their containers or on their machines, however they want to run it, that allows us to either build more third-party tools and build out the functionality of those or just, you know, see what's going on, you know? It's, it's, it's a beneficial to devs regardless of who uses that data. They're built by folks who know the platform best, which gives us, like I said, more insight onto how things work, work running on the platform, but also they can, del they can keep pace with the intricacies of their platform a lot easier than third-party groups can, because third-party tools have to be reactionary unless they're working directly with a vendor, which happens, but not always. So when you've got reactionary third-party tools, with vendor tools, you don't necessarily have to be reactionary. You can launch a tool with a new feature. Third-party tools can, provi can provide a consistent API for multiple vendors, and because we are kind of in the Wild West stage of serverless slash function as a service, that's necessary because when you decide to build a serverless app, you now have a field of providers to look for. And that can be daunting if you're asked to build a proof of concept on every conceivable platform. But with tools like the serverless framework, that makes it a little easier, makes your life a little easier. You can write one function under several different templates, launch them all on the different providers, and go without having to learn the intricacies of each platform, which you don't need to do if you're just writing a proof of concept. Third-party tools can deep, very deep into one use case or solution that a vendor may not have the time or resources to devote to that one use case or that one solution. Uh, there's lots of different types of tools out there. They're like just lumping them into the three categories of development, diagnostics, and visualization took me like three hours of brainstorming as to like how do I logically group these into less than 20 categories. So vendors have to cater to all of the things so they can't necessarily dive deep into every single thing. There's not an unlimited amount of resources there. Whereas third-party tools can say, okay, I really care about this one use case, and they can really drill down into that, especially when vendors give them access to the information that they need to drill down into that particular use case. So you see the symbiotic relationship between third-party and, tool and vendor tools. Um, I found that third-party tools can bring use cases to light that were originally missed by vendors. Um, it happens to all of us. Sometimes we just don't think of a use case. Uh, I remember uh, when I was at Serverless Conf Austin, I had my, my longboard with me, and uh, they were like, I bet AWS didn't think about a longboard as a use case when they built AWS Lambda. I'm like, no, they probably didn't, like, but they probably thought about IoT. Um, in fact, they definitely thought about IoT, if you've seen green grass. But there are going to be use cases that are going to pop up in the developer community that vendors are going to go, oh, I see what you're getting at. And that's where third-party tools really shine, is bringing out those use cases and showing that there's a base for them, showing that there's people using them. So it's kind of our way to indirectly communicate back to the vendors, hey, we like your product, but we also want to be able to do this. I'm way ahead of time, but I'm glad for that, because you know I don't want the data to run late. Um, in conclusion, tooling is going to continue to be a major need for function as a service. Who here has spent more than 30 minutes in the past month debugging a serverless problem? Right? Quite a few hands went up. We need that number to go down over time, not up. Otherwise, we're going to see that, 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 uh, that oh, serverless is terrible. Whereas I, I'd rather see, it, OK, I, I get serverless isn't good for everything. That's what I would prefer that down trough to be, because that's why there's always a down tick. Because the uptick, the spike, is always, I've got a hammer. Everything's a nail. <laughs> and right now, serverless is that hammer. <laughs> and that's not uh, always the best solution. I, I, um, I've had folks come up to me at serverless conferences and go, well, I'm using serverless to do this, and how can I make it better? And I'm like, honestly, I don't think that's, that's, a good, that's not what serverless was meant for. So this, this is, it's a tool, just like any other tool. You've got to use it for the right thing. But I would prefer the trough to be, OK, OK, we, we went a little overboard. We, we tried to use it for everything, and now we know what it's good for. But, and not, oh my god, serverless was an awful idea. Why did we ever do this? Ah. 
Development, diagnostic, and visual visualization tools are all crucial. We need all of these categories because devs need to be able to work, devs need to be able to sleep, and devs need to be able to not flip their desk when there's an unknown syntax error on a line number that doesn't exist. Fans, it keeps, why does it keep auto-correcting F? Like, I corrected it last night and now it's recorrecting the fans. It used to say falls. Function as a service providers and third parties have a mutually beneficial environment to build tools in similar spaces. Especially as more and more of the, of the serverless and function as a service providers are embracing the open source community. Microsoft has made huge strides in accepting the open source community. Um, you can see it just in how they're hiring. They're hiring people who are paragons of the OSS community. And that's great. So you see, and you, you see them working with open source projects, and you see them open sourcing a lot more of their code. And because of that environment, a, a, that, that coincidental collision in timelines, we've got a great environment to build third party and vendor tools together. AWS is getting there on the whole open source function. They're, really, they're good at working with third party tools, but they, we've got some open source work to do with them. Um, but still, we've got a great environment for third parties and vendors to build tools together or to build tools in similar spaces that work well together. Thanks for listening. My email is cass at iopipe.com. If you have any questions about anything I've spoken about here today or iopipe or server, serverless or, hey, what are you working on there in the back? Because I'll probably be working on a bot. Um, feel free to email me or come talk to me. Uh, I'm node botanist on Twitter, GitHub, uh, Blizzard, everything. Um, so yeah, you can find me that way. And then uh, I'm also a host on serverlesspodcast.com if you're looking for a podcast about serverless. We haven't done an episode in a little while, but we're, we're ramping back up. So uh, we'll be doing more episodes soon. And the ones that already exist are still fairly relevant. I listened to one the other day. It's, hold, it's held up pretty well. So yeah, I think that's, yep, that's my last slide. So thank you very much. <laughs>